And now today's featured speaker is Bentley University Professor David Gully. Dave Gully is currently Interim Chair of the Department of Economics and has been at Bentley since 1990. He specializes in macroeconomics, monetary economics, and financial markets. He has been co-advisor to Bentley's Fed Challenge teams since 2007 and teaches courses in macroeconomics and monetary economics at the undergraduate and graduate levels. He is also a proud alum of the University of Kentucky. Without further ado, please join me in virtually welcoming David Gully. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And hi to everybody else. Thank you just so much for joining us today. Uh, so let me take us first through uh, our agenda. Uh, what I'll try to do is give us a quick snapshot of the current economy and the current financial situation, uh, and then turn to talk about how, how bad things might get. Uh, what uh, kind of responses have been in terms of monetary and fiscal policy, uh, speak about when things might start to get better, uh, and, and then maybe speculate about what some of the long-run impacts might be. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about uh, maybe how Bentley alums and students uh, could be impacted by this. Uh, and so in terms of starting out looking at uh, the snapshot, we're about five weeks in, uh, give or take here. And in terms of past macroeconomic shocks, uh, this one has been by far the largest and the fastest on record. Uh, we don't really have a precedent for it yet. And uh, some data have already been released, but we don't really fully understand the full magnitude yet because macro data uh, are not designed to deal with such sudden shifts uh, that we've observed. But what we can say so far is that at least initially, uh, the impact on blue collar and lower paying jobs has been uh, uh, disproportionate. Uh, so, for example, uh, a lot of people have bills due on April 1st, and uh, businesses and people just didn't have the cash uh, to make a lot of their bill payments. And specifically, for example, uh, about a third of renters are already behind uh, on their rent payment. And, uh, you know, May 1st, of course, is, is rapidly approaching us. Uh, on the next round of job cuts, though, and we're starting to see this already, uh, these might turn around and hit white collar and higher paying jobs. In other words, jobs uh, more likely to be taken by Bentley students and Bentley alums. And we've also observed a feedback loop uh, between economic and financial conditions. And so once the economy uh, was shut down, that triggered a number of financial problems. People uh, were not able to make mortgage and debt payments. Businesses were not able to make mortgage and debt payments. And these in turn trigger additional economic problems. So we have this, this, this uh, negative, or this, excuse me, this positive feedback loop here. And so, you know, to use a little bit of uh, economics here, we've got a big negative supply shock, business shutdowns, for example, and an even bigger negative demand shock, people reducing and businesses reducing their purchases. And so in the aggregate, these things are going to reduce GDP, they're going to reduce employment, and they're going to possibly even cause deflation. And so in terms of um, you know, talking about uh, the economic data, it's probably better to show things. And so for example, uh, just this morning, uh, it was announced that uh, over 5 million new people filed for first time uh, unemployment benefits. And that follows last week, 6.6 .6 million, the week before is uh, 6.9 million, and the week before that, the 3.3 million. And as you can see here in the chart, uh, you know, these are uh, you know, unprecedented magnitudes. I mean, if you go back to the Great Recession, back over here on the left, uh, those job losses seem absolutely puny compared to uh, the current uh, spate of job losses just in the last four weeks. And to give some context here, about 22 million is noted over there on the right side of the chart and lost their jobs. Approximately speaking, that's the number of jobs that have been gained in the last 10 years. So that's how quickly this has hit uh, the, uh, the job market. So we have this. Uh, we also have dramatic uh, decreases uh, in asset prices here. So this is the S&P 500 falling. We've also had, on the other scale, the VIX index, which is a measure of volatility. We've had gigantic volatility in financial markets. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, so it's not surprising that we see all this volatility. Or, for example, just yesterday, uh, we saw uh, retail sales at the aggregate level fall by uh, very nearly 9%. And you can see over there on the right how dramatic that is relative to even the changes from the Great Recession back in 2008 and 2009. And as terrible as that figure is, that underestimates or, or underrepresents uh, the impact on particular industries. For example, the clothing and general retail industry, 
their sales were down 50% from February, uh, which, which is completely unprecedented. And it's very likely that we could see similar figures uh, going from March to April. So at least there's no evidence yet of those things getting better. So let me turn back uh, to the labor market and look back at this in a little more detail because this is getting, of course, a lot of attention. So for some context, the unemployment rate during the Great Depression uh, got up to almost 25%. During the Great Recession, it, it climbed to about uh, 10%. So our most recent unemployment data we have is from March, and that went up uh, to 4.4% from the 3.5 in February. And even that 0.9 percentage point increase, that is unprecedented all by itself. There's a broader measure of unemployment that includes a, sort of a looser definition of who's unemployed. That went up uh, over a percentage point. The problem, though, with these is that these data are backward looking. And so the March employment data uh, that we're looking at here uh, came from uh, surveys done in early March. That's before we had the widespread shutdowns. So these data don't even close to represent you know, how bad things are actually out there. And so what I thought I would do is take a shot at trying to you know, give a, you know, a contemporaneous you know, real-time estimate of what the unemployment rate might be. Uh, and you know, to, to keep in mind here some, some context is to be uh, in the official definition of unemployed, you have to you know, kind of obviously not have a job, but you also have had to at least look for one in the last four weeks. And if you don't, then you drop out of the measured unemployment rate. And what I've done here is assuming that there's no ch change in the size of the overall labor force and looking at just the 22 million figure of the new jobless claims in the last four weeks, the current estimate I've come up with, and again, this is very rough here, is just a little bit under 17%. And I'm not able at this point to look at the details in terms of uh, the level of hiring. Those data haven't yet been released, and even those are also lagging, so we're not going to have good information for at least one more month or possibly even two. We can look at one more visual here with the labor market and look at what's called the employment to population ratio. This is the total number of people employed to the entire population. And so just week, this week, there was a, a paper published uh, by some folks, and they estimated what the employment to population ratio um, has fallen to, and you can see over here on the, on the left, uh, this was during the depths of the Great Recession. And over here now on the right, their estimate of the number of people employed relative to the size of the population has fallen uh, by nearly eight percentage points. And that's absolutely staggering in terms of how quickly and how dramatically uh, and how severely uh, this shutdown uh, has become. So how bad things, uh, how, how bad might things get? Um, really bad. I don't really have any other uh, way to say that. Um, I've seen estimates, for example, from Jim Bullard uh, looking at the unemployment rate being high as 30% sometime this quarter. Uh, Goldman Sachs has estimated that real GDP could drop by uh, as much as over a third uh, in the second quarter. Uh, other countries are only starting to see a ramp up in their cases, so their, their economies are going to be hit. And then other countries um, you know, developing countries, especially with relatively weak public health systems and very uh, fragile financial markets, uh, they might uh, be hit with kind of like this double whammy. So here's a visual from the uh, OECD, uh, and this looks at an estimate of the economic impact of the shutdowns uh, in Canada, Germany, France, Great Britain, Italy, and the U.S., and they're all in the magnitude of around 25 percentage points. And granted, they make some assumptions here, and these might be, you know, a little bit overstated, but possibly not. And so I think maybe Goldman Sachs estimate was a little bit uh, over the top, but who knows at this point? I mean, almost all macroeconomists were pretty much all guessing because macro data are not designed to keep track of or take into account such quick changes in the underlying economy. The good news, or I guess maybe a little bit of good news, is that uh, the fiscal and monetary policy responses have been very aggressive and very fast. So for example, the CARES Act that was just passed several weeks ago uh, distributes unemployment benefits, uh, direct checks to households, loans to companies, and so forth. And what's critical here is that the response is much faster and it's much larger relative to uh, the fiscal policy response during the Great Recession. Monetary response, monetary policy has also been um, 
very dramatic. They have taken their playbook from the, the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, and they've opened it up. They've used everything, and then they've expanded the playbook uh, to include some uh, brand new policy tools here. Again, like with fiscal policy, monetary policy response has been faster and larger. And so far, at least, financial markets have functioning, are functioning reasonably well, uh, especially in comparison to the Great Recession. And moreover, we've got some market responses. So here, you know, firms are adjusting production. Food companies are changing from producing for restaurants to producing for households. People, at least some folks, are able to change jobs. Uh, companies like Walmart, companies like Amazon and so forth, they're hiring tens and tens of thousands of people. So some of the people who've lost their jobs might be able to find positions with these new companies. But that certainly, of course, isn't going to cover everybody, unfortunately. In terms of when things might get better, uh, you know, it's really uh, the virus is dictating the underlying timeline here. Maybe by the end of April, things will stop getting worse in at least most uh, of the U.S., especially considering uh, the, where the population is. But in terms of how quickly things get generally actually better, this could be a fairly long time. This could be well into the summer. This could be July or August or hopefully, uh, or hopefully not, you know, possibly even later. And so then trying to think about when the economy might reopen. There's been a lot of attention to this, you know, at the, you know, in the White House, for example, right now, they're trying to figure out the conditions under which this is going to happen. And in looking at what the public health experts are, are talking about, you've got to really have some of the issues regarding the virus under control. So you have to get the cases down to where the hospitals can manage these sustainably. Testing has to be dramatically expanded both in terms of finding who has the virus and who has had it so that, you know, that there are, we know how many people are now immune. We have to be able to trace and quarantine people when there are small outbreaks. And so there's a lot of things that haven't yet happened with public health that need to begin to happen so that the economy can start to, to function again, can start to reopen. And what's critical here um, is that this isn't going to be like flipping on a, a light switch and businesses just open up and things go more or less back to normal. In the absence, for example, of uh, a, a vaccine and uncertainty about who has or who hasn't had the virus and who's immune and so forth, businesses are going to have to change dramatically in some cases how they operate. Restaurants, for example, uh, won't be crowded anymore. A crowded restaurant will become almost an oxymoron here, at least in the near future. There are, when the economy starts to get better, reasons to think it might be relatively strong. Production will start up again. Some businesses will be able to reopen relatively quickly. Uh, there should be some substantial pent-up demand you know, for, for some things, of course. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the policy responses have been dramatically better relative to the Great uh, Recession and have been completely orders of magnitude here better than the Great Depression. But, there are some reasons to be a little bit pessimistic in terms of how quickly uh, the economy might recover. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of people being comfortable around crowds. Uh, consider, for example, I've seen surveys where uh, a lot of people are not interested in going to uh, large sporting events, for example, or conventions or any other large gatherings of people until they can be certain that, uh, you know, that the virus isn't going to be spread. Uh, social distancing in the workplace is going to continue, so businesses and offices and so forth might need to be redesigned in a less than optimal way. Uh, and as closures uh, go on each every, and every day, that might put more businesses uh, in financial peril. Uh, it's relatively difficult in some cases to get bridge financing, meaning to keep them uh, functioning until they can reopen again. Uh, as an example here, uh, the CARES Act funds for the Small Business Administration, the, three, the $350 billion, those are already expired, or those have already all been exhausted. They haven't been distributed yet, but all the funds have already been effectively spoken for. Uh, household finances have been pretty damaged. Uh, people are already behind on their rent. Uh, they're already behind on their mortgages. Uh, they're already running up their credit card bills. So those things are going to take some time uh, to uh, recover. And then finally here, the changing business landscape, um, the retail sector, for example, uh, you know, physical brick and mortar stores that were just hanging on, those might not come back at all, even once the economy starts to open up again. There are some things to be a little bit optimistic about. Uh, the virus is starting to slow in at least some places. 
Uh, financial markets are stabilizing. Uh, funds at some point, hopefully in the next few weeks, will make it into some businesses. Eventually, of course, we'll have treatments and maybe even a vaccine, social distancing, and that stuff will, will start to, to fall away. But these things will take a while. They're not going to, to happen, unfortunately, right away. In terms of thinking about how Bentley alums and students are affected, uh, at least right now, the financial services industry has not been hit as hard. Uh, and the overall idea here is that, comparatively speaking, people with college degrees are much more likely to be able uh, to conduct their jobs uh, remotely uh, compared to those folks without college degrees. So at least so far, those the occupations and job categories haven't been hit as hard. Unfortunately, the job market for this year's grads uh, has gotten uh, materially worse just in the last few weeks. Uh, and speaking to the career services people uh, just last week and uh, yesterday, most firms seem to be uh, standing by their offers, though they might be uh, delaying starting dates and things like this. Uh, we have seen uh, a few uh, 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 job offers being rescinded uh, from companies, but those at least so far are the smaller companies. Hopefully that won't uh, go any farther. And then of course, uh, on a continuing basis, we're very concerned about our first year students and our returning students. Uh, you know, how have their family and their financial situations uh, been improved? And how are we going to be able to come back as an institution in the fall? Uh, will we continue to be Zoom U or will we be back uh, in some form of uh, in-person classes, even if they're, they're modified somewhat? Uh, and then finally here, I'm really not gonna speak to this very much uh, because there's a lot of things that we could speculate about. What might some of the longer run impacts be? The general sort of way to maybe think about this or frame this is that in past situations, these kinds of crises have accelerated underlying changes in an economy or a culture or society that have already been underway. So for example, relatively weak companies that might have been barely hanging on, they might be driven out of business. Relatively stronger companies, they might become even stronger. There are probably going to be substantial changes in public uh, healthcare infrastructure, uh, consumer buying habits are going to very likely change. As an example here, uh, online uh, shopping companies have uh, you know, profited dramatically. They've seen gigantic increase in sales. That's unlikely to completely reverse. Uh, it's highly likely we're going to see a total reorganization in some cases of company supply change. Uh, how higher education is going to be delivered. And of course, we could go on and on here. Uh, but it is the case often that uh, crises and, and difficult situations can create creativity, create solutions uh, to newly created problems. So thank you so much uh, for listening and I'm looking forward uh, to all your questions. Great, all right, well we have, as I mentioned, we have quite a few questions to ask. So we'll start with one that has been pre-submitted. Um, so this question comes to us from Robert B. Davis, class of 74 and trustee emeritus. Um, he says, the economic impact from this pandemic is significant. What is the likely recovery time to sustained growth and full employment? If I, if I have to throw out a, a, a rough estimate and a guess on that, it is probably not until the virus is completely under control in terms of um, having a, an effective, widely distributed vaccine. Um, until then, we're going to need social distancing. Until then, there are going to be hot spots. Until then, there's going to be uncertainty. So people aren't going to be willing to gather in crowds. Uh, they aren't going to be willing to go to crowded restaurants, for example, things like this. Uh, and so until those kinds of conditions fade away, uh, economic activity is going to be hampered. And that probably isn't until um, you know, late next year. Uh, and that's sort of on the optimistic timeline of a, a vaccine being uh, first developed and then being rolled out to uh, you know, literally billions of people. And so that takes a, a quite a bit of time to do. So unfortunately, I think until we get back to, you know, more or less normal, that's going to take a while. But even still, there are going to be, you know, residual effects. There are going to be retail stores. There are going to be companies. There might be entire occupations or industries that are simply not going to come back like they did. And, and the best example I can think of is retail. Uh, a lot of brick and mortar stores who are just hanging on, they're not going to come back. They are going to stay closed because the demand simply isn't going to be there 
because of changing consumer preferences and consumer behavior. Thank you. Um, we're getting quite a few questions now. So just as a reminder, if you have a question, feel free to enter it in the question and answer box. Um, an easy question, and just as a reminder, everyone will receive a copy of this presentation after, as far as a, a recording of the presentation. So again, check your email boxes tomorrow. All right, this question comes to us live from Anthony Kusmanidis. Sorry if I butchered your last name. Um, do you feel that the Fed buying fallen angels and getting into lower credit bonds are dangerous and could lead to potentially even getting into the stocks if need be? Where does the Fed draw a line on the quality of bonds? That's an important uh, question. So thank you very much for asking that. Um, the idea is that in a lot of the Fed's lending programs that they've introduced, uh, historically, what they've done is they've only purchased uh, investment grade securities. And in that case, they've often only purchased the highest investment grade securities rated, rated AAA. In this situation, though, they've moved substantially down uh, the rating scale. In some cases, moving into uh, securities that are now no longer rated uh, investment grade. They've gone down to triple B, or excuse me, double B minus. The way that's these programs are structured so far is the Fed is at least in theory insulated from some of the losses in two respects. The first is that uh, the institutions that tendered these securities to the Fed, if these default, these institutions are responsible, at least to some extent. It's also the case that the Treasury has backstopped the Fed up to about, at least right now, uh, around $450 billion. So from the Fed's point of view, again, at least so far under these circumstances, their losses are, are for the most part, backstopped. Now, that doesn't mean, however, that there couldn't be some longer term impacts here. Uh, so as the Fed has gone down uh, the, uh, the rating list here, that's made more companies eligible. And so that allows more funds to flow into the economy. And so that on the, that on the one hand can be uh, very solid in terms of helping keep these companies going and help them get financing where they otherwise couldn't. But the farther down you go on that, that ratings chain, the more risk there is to some combination of the underlying institutions, the government, and perhaps even eventually the Fed. Then of course you could go all the way down into buying equities. And now you're crossing over into, you know, effectively public ownership of particular companies. And let me give you an example here. If in, the, in Japan, the Bank of Japan has been buying uh, ETFs, exchange traded funds issued by uh, public Japanese companies. So the Bank of Japan is now a major owner of shares of some of the largest Japanese companies. And over time, this could put pressure on the central bank to not uh, not sell back those exchange traded funds in order to not put downward pressure on equity prices. And so you have to be very careful in thinking about what are some of these longer run impacts and some of these longer run impacts could in fact be negative. But the, the question that's important right now is, well, what's the balance between perhaps the longer run risks and trying to keep the economy functioning for as well as possible until the underlying cause here, you know, the coronavirus, um, gets back under control. Thank you. I think that was an excellent explanation of a challenging question. Um, you spoke a little bit about this, especially in regard to Bentley, but uh, Randy Bennell wants to know, how do you see this impacting colleges and school systems? Wow, okay, so let's see. Again, it sort of depends on the, the timeline of the virus here. If it continues to be problematic, if social distancing is still in place, if there are still outbreaks, uh, if students are and parents are unwilling to come back to a physical campus, it could be the case that schools might either have to continue being Zoom U to some extent or dramatically modify their physical uh, infrastructure to run classes with you know, half or maybe even a third of people that are spaced out in a given size classroom. If that's the case, the situation here is you have a fixed cost of running a, a campus, but only maybe half or a third of the physical students on the campus who are paying for its upkeep and its maintenance and its, and its functioning. That isn't a sustainable situation. Many universities simply do not have either the cash flow 
or the endowments to weather that kind of situation for very long. I mean, already there are a number of schools who are relatively small, small regional schools, uh, liberal arts schools, um, you know, in the Midwest and places like that, who were, you know, moving along, I guess, more or less okay. This kind of a situation is going to put them in existential peril as it is. Uh, and then going forward, even if they're able to recover, then six or seven years from now, we have the high school enrollment cliff, and they might be pushed over the edge then. So a lot of schools are going to lose a lot of time in preparing for that demographic problem that's coming six or seven years from now. Um, and even still, even over the next two years, we could see a number of schools go under simply because uh, they see a decline in demand for uh, enrollments, maybe some of their students um, parents uh, and the students themselves, their financial condition is jeopardized in a way that doesn't allow them to go back. Uh, so they lose the revenue, they can't uh, you know, pay for their physical infrastructure, and they might end up going out of business. And I think that's going to be probably more than a few schools, unfortunately. Yeah, as you mentioned, with that demographic cliff, it adds a, a dynamic to yes. this. Yes. Unfortunately, as well. We are getting lots of questions around the real estate market, and um, I will just say, put in a plug for future upcoming, we will be offering a real estate session in the future, but um, to the extent that you can talk about how this might impact the real estate market, we have quite a few questions um, asking whether or not you see a housing crash or um, about the sharp, short and long-term economic impact on the housing market. Okay, so that's, let's see, let me, let me try to see if I can't make, make a, and I'm not making up an answer here, but let me see if I can try to organize an answer uh, that it makes at least some sense. And so I guess, let me start with the, the uh, residential housing market. And so at least so far, it seems that uh, the housing market is sort of frozen in its tracks, so to speak. Showings and closings and all the standard things that happen there, uh, those have slowed down or maybe even stopped uh, in, in many cases. Uh, in terms of uh, new home sales, those have fallen very dramatically. Uh, refinances, interestingly, are up somewhat uh, as mortgage interest rates have fallen. That's benefited people who can refinance from a higher to a lower interest rate, so that improves their position. Uh, and that's, of course, as long as their job and their general financial situation hasn't been uh, too adversely impacted. Uh, I'm not, it's harder to get a feel in terms of what the longer run impact on housing prices might be. If the underlying economy doesn't stay down for too long, I don't think the problem will be that big. Again, that, I, there's a lot of caveats uh, in that because um, you still have, you know, you have demographic issues and things like this that help drive long run housing demand. Uh, and you also still have um, relatively low construction of new houses and so you have a relatively lower supply and a sort of a questionable impact on what demand might be. Uh, and so the impact on prices might be questionable. I don't think it's going to be as bad as it was during the Great Recession. There we had far too many houses being built and far too many people buying houses who were not in a stable, solid financial condition to buy them. So we don't have those kinds of conditions here this time around. So I, I don't think it'll get as bad. I think where it might get worse is the commercial real estate market. Uh, you know, for example, let's consider a shopping mall. Shopping mall has been closed. None of the tenants are generating any cash flow. No generating no cash flow. They're not paying their rent. Lots of businesses have stopped paying their rent, all the way from little tiny businesses, all the way to large businesses uh, who have positions, uh, you know, retail space in malls. So those shopping malls, that almost all of which have large mortgages taken out against them, suddenly the owners of those malls are in severe financial straits. Similarly, office buildings, a company is closed, it's not generating revenue, they're not able to make their rent or their lease payments. And so it goes all the way back up the supply chain in terms of the commercial real estate market. And the question is, out of whose pockets does, does this problem eventually have to be paid for? Uh, and everybody is trying to, to push it off to someone else, and that can't work because at some point somebody has to, you know, make the rent payment, make the mortgage payment, etc. And so the commercial real estate industry, I think, is probably going to be more affected 
than the residential real estate market. And those effects might not just be temporary until firms start to reopen, but permanent is if a lot of retail stores end up going under, you're gonna have a lot of empty space in, uh, in malls and other shopping outlets. Great, and this leads to an anonymous question. Um, I will also just say that I need to plug in my laptop battery. So while you answer this question, I'll okay. do that. Um, this is the nature of live events. Um, what will happen to interest rates? Oh boy, okay. So I think we have to break this down for short-term and long-term and then risky and risk-less assets. So short-term, relatively low, low risk interest rates, those are gonna stay low for a very long time. Uh, the Fed has pledged uh, with its monetary policy not to raise short-term interest rates until the economy is way, way better and inflation is getting back up to around or even above its 2% target. That's probably not going to even start to happen until well into next year. And so for the next, you know, 12, 18 months or possibly even longer, we're looking at very low short-term interest rates. We're also probably looking at very low longer-term riskless interest rate, like for example, treasuries or relatively low risk corporate municipal bonds and things like this. Um, the Fed, uh, its QE programs that it's introduced now uh, dwarf uh, the QE programs from the Great Recession as an example uh, at the height of QE3 back in 2013, uh, they, the Fed was buying $85 billion in treasuries and mortgage-backed securities per month. Recently, the Fed has been buying a combined $125 billion per day of mortgage-backed and treasury securities. So that's gonna help push those kinds of longer-term interest rates down. But to the extent that there's a flight to quality, which also helps to push those longer term safe interest rates down. That flight to quality implies that people are flying out of assets that are relatively risky. So those interest rates have risen pretty dramatically. So the credit spreads have risen a lot, though the, even the announcements of some of the Fed's lending facilities have helped push some of those credit spreads, uh, not down where they were, but at least down to a manageable level. And at least so far, as bad as the underlying economy is, all the indices, all the indicators of financial stress, yield curve, credit spreads, things like this are dramatically lower right now than they were at the peak of the Great Recession. And to some extent, I think that speaks of uh, the Fed's more aggressive reaction here. And also to the fact that at least here, the problems didn't start in the financial markets. They started, you know, they started somewhere else. Yeah, it's interesting how the relative closeness between the recession of 2008-2009 to this, I'm sure, impacts a lot of the decisions being made. Yes, yes. Um, all right, we have so many questions. Let's see, the next one is about the travel industry. So Jacob Ranker wants to know, how will travel recover from this? Will the U.S. need to bail out its airlines or should they naturally fall from the market and make room for new players? Good question. Um, so the, the impact on the travel industry has been, uh, to put it mildly dramatic. Uh, for example, just yesterday, American Airlines uh, announced that their revenue for their last reporting period had fallen 90%. No business can tolerate a 90% decline in revenue and survive for any length of time. Uh, and already airlines uh, are in line to receive uh, some federal support. Uh, how much they'll get is still open to question and how long they'll be able to get it is open to question. And then how long that will allow them to continue functioning, you know, paying their employees, um, you know, paying for their gates and things like this. That's an open question. What they need, of course, is for people to start flying again, taking cruises again, and so on. And going back to the discussions we've had here previously, it's not going to be until we have the end of social distancing that, that airlines are going to be able to run full planes, that cruise ships are going to be able to run full cruise ships. Now, that's absent the uncertainty of people and their question of, gosh, do I even want to get on any plane or do I want to get on any cruise ship? Because we've all heard the stories of the cruise ships being trapped at sea for weeks and weeks. And that's not really appealing to people for obvious reasons. Uh, so it could be a long time before those industries uh, reach any sort of semblance of normalcy. And in the, in, 
in the interim. It may be that some of them might go out of business or at the very least, they're going to become much smaller uh, than they were. Uh, in terms of new players, uh, it's, it's possible, but it's, you know, maybe something along this, these lines might happen. If an airline ends up going out of business, uh, an existing airline might end up purchasing their planes, purchasing their routes, purchasing their gates. And so what we might end up seeing is not necessarily new players, but we might end up seeing a consolidation in an already relatively consolidated industry, because you know, cruise line industry is consolidated as is the, as is the airline industry too. Thank you. Um, all right, this question, we're gonna keep on the role of um, different sectors here. So Vivek Malang asks, what about the manufacturing sector? You've stated that it is also impacted. How long um, will the critical industries take time to recover, especially those like steel, aluminum, and other industries? Well, it's, it's gonna vary a lot by industry. Industries that are relatively highly automated, like steel production, for example, it's relatively easy for the employees in a steel plant to maintain social distance. In other kinds of industries, uh, specific manufacturing industries, it's a lot more difficult. Consider the manufacture of automobiles or really any almost mass produced uh, consumer good. Uh, those uh, production facilities, as highly automated as they are, still require a lot of people and they require a lot of people in relatively close contact. And if those people can't be in relatively close contact without risk of, of respreading the disease, the production processes are gonna to have to, to be reorganized. Production lines are gonna to have to be reorganized so you can allow people to produce the same thing, except you know, they're physically farther apart. So that will probably increase production costs, probably slow down production lines. So it could be, again, a long time before, you know, this was months before companies can really fully reorganize that. Um, you know, even food processing plants, a lot of those are extremely people oriented. They're, they're a high degree of, of labor within a, a production plant. And so as a result, companies are trying to figure out how they can, you know, reorganize their production processes, you know, space between people, um, you know, screens between people and so forth in order to continue production you know, as, as efficiently as possible. But there's going to be a lot of adjustment and there's going to be a lot more cost to produce a given amount of output than compared to previously. Right, we've definitely seen that with the, the meat uh, industry. Yes. At least. yes. All right, our next question comes from Alexander Esposito. With trillions of dollars in negative interest rates out there before the outbreak, how do you see other economies handling monetary stimulus with no room to go on rate drops? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, these are all, by the way, great questions and they're, they're really fun here. So I'm not, I'm not pulling out or picking out any particular one. Uh, so in uh, a lot of the, not a lot, but at least some of the rest of the world, especially uh, in Europe, uh, central banks have moved to negative interest rate. They, they've moved to charging uh, banks holding money with the central bank fees rather than the reverse and, and paying fee or paying interest when a bank deposits money with the central bank. And the intent of those negative interest rates is to discourage banks from holding funds with the central bank and instead lend those funds out or buy other securities or in general to stimulate or to try to stimulate the economy. Those central banks, I think, have uh, less of what's called policy room. Policy room uh, is the, 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 the magnitude of a central bank's response. And so let me give a quick example here with the Fed. In previous recessions, back in the 80s and the 90s, the Federal Reserve had been on average able to lower its, its standard policy tool, the federal funds rate, by about five percentage points. In this situation, they've only been able to lower it by a little over two percentage points. So much less on that front. But a good case can be made that they can sort of make up for that lack of standard policy room with their QE program and with their other lending programs. So even though they can only lower the federal funds rate by a little bit, they can kind of make up for that in other ways. Other central banks are much more limited. They had effectively no room to lower their short-term interest rate given those already zero. I mean, for example, the ECB lowered theirs by 10 basis points from a negative number to a slightly more negative number. That had very little marginal impact. They've also announced expanded QE programs. 
but not to the scale of the Fed. They also haven't um, announced any sort of uh, lending programs a la what the Fed has done. So if you compare the Fed and other major central banks like the ECB, the BOE, the BOJ, et cetera, the Fed has, its programs are far more dramatic and far, I think, are going to be relatively more effective. And in terms of creativity contest, the US Fed easily wins the most creative central bank by far. So I don't think the other central bank's response is going to help nearly as much in those countries as the Fed's response has helped here. In those countries, it's going to become much more of a fiscal policy response compared to a monetary, monetary policy response. Because here, the Fed and the government have been able to, to share a lot of the, the policy response burden equally, more or less. That's not so in, in many, many other countries, unfortunately. Great, I know we got that, a similar question um, in the pre-submitted questions as well. Um, so this question comes from Mark Solomon, and he wants to know how and when do they state we are officially in a recession? or even a depression. And we kind of covered this already, but the second part of this question is, what does the crystal ball say about the amount of time to recover from that? Okay, so in terms of, of how we officially define a recession, sort of the standard um, you know, back of the envelope uh, definition of two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. And so we're certainly going to have that. There is, interestingly, and this is some sort of, sort of economic trivia here, there is a committee of economists at the, at the National Bureau of Economic Research. They're called the, the Business Cycle Dating Committee. So they are in sort of an unofficial committee of economists who, after the fact, they don't try to predict when a recession is going to happen or when it's going to end. They date the official beginning and then you look at data and they try to pinpoint the month in which the recession began. So here it's gonna be pretty easy. It's going to be March because February was the high point there were really very few impacts, at least at that point, and everything went off the cliff in March. So March is going to be the official beginning point of this. And then in terms of when it ends, that could, the end of it could be relatively fast. It's probably going to be this year. And the way it, the end is defined is not when things are back to 100%, it's when things stop getting worse. And so it's entirely possible that job losses and the decline in GDP could be reversed as early as this summer. Not dramatically, it won't go back to normal, of course, but it'll at least stop falling and begin to rise. That'll be the end of the official recession, but the point from the end of the recession to returning to where we began, that might take some years. Now, exactly how many years, I don't know. A lot of it, again, depends on how quickly a vaccine is developed, and how quickly that gets dispersed out to the you know, what effectively you know, the, the worldwide population. And if we had that crystal ball, we'd all be yes, a lot happier, yes. I'm sure. Um, all right, our next question comes from Sophia Chan, class of 2007. I know she already submitted a question in the preliminary registration as well. So let's make sure we answer this one. You mentioned that you don't see brick and mortar stores coming back after. Uh, could you please expand on that and what assumptions or factors do you see being critical in that happening? Yeah, again, I'm not saying that all brick and mortar stores you know, won't come back, but there, over time, there's been a very clear trend toward online buying. Over time, as consumers get more comfortable, over time, as there are more choices and options in terms of being able to purchase different goods and services online, given the convenience, the cost, the choice, et cetera, there's been a general trend toward online here. At points in time, you know, various outside shocks happen to accelerate trends, and this is one of them. And so as people haven't been able to you know, go to stores they've been, or they've been uncomfortable you know, going to stores because of social distancing, things like this, they've said, all right, well, let's look at trying to buy something online. And so maybe they haven't done this before, maybe they haven't shopped online before, they haven't bought groceries online before, and now they are through Peapod or Instacart or somebody else, they might find that convenient because if they can get the, the goods they want, the food they want, they don't have to take the risk in the store, they might stick with that. Some folks might, you know, of course, go back to the store, but a lot of people won't. People buying clothing online, mostly, most clothing by far is still bought live and in person. Well, 
the longer social distancing goes, the, the longer the, the virus is not fully brought under control, lockdown orders, et cetera, are still in place, people might start experimenting with buying clothes online. If that works out okay, you know, the, the shoes or the pants or the, 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 you know, the top that they buy is all right, well, they might keep going with that. And the more people patronize the online version of a, of a store, the fewer people are, of course, going to the underlying retail store. And in the US, over the last, you know, three to four years even, so over the last three to four years, the economy has been, been pretty good. Not awesome, but at least pretty good. Even still, thousands of retail stores have closed up because of people's changing buying the habits, you know, going online, been consolidation, et cetera. This is dramatically accelerating that. Suddenly, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of retail outlets have closed. When things become sort of under control again, and there's consideration of do we open up again, a lot of those stores are going to say no. Or if they do, if they do open up, they won't find sufficient business anymore and they'll end up closing down relatively quickly. So a lot of retail outlets, clothing outlets and, and things like this are simply not going to come back or even if they do, they're not going to last very long. And that's, that's very unfortunate. Yeah, I, I fear we're in the same issue with uh, brick and mortar restaurants as well. Yes. Have yes. able to get it. Yeah. Um, here's another question of kind of about trending online. So David Andrews wants to know to expand on the question regarding the housing market. If work from home becomes a more accepted business practice, how might this affect commercial real estate in urban areas like Boston? That's a really good question. And so Certainly some occupations are more amenable to working at home. You know, for example, you know, right here, I'm coming to you from my very scenic uh, home office. I saw a cow to you in my backyard just a, a little while ago, just before this started. Uh, and so more or less, I can do my job, uh, you know, from home. More or less, lots of other people, you know, can do their job from home as well. And so then the question is, well, our business is going to think about, well, do we really need an office anymore? Or do we need as much office space as we used to. Can we efficiently and cost effectively have more of our workforce be from home? And maybe you, the way you incentivize that is you give people allowances um, you know, for equipment and, and so on. It's really hard to tell that what is going to happen, I'm sure, is that once this is you know, more or less over, companies will be having that discussion they'll figure, try to figure out, well, can we work with half the office space or a third of the office space that we used to? Can we work with rotating offices? Do we need, you know, instead of the 500 people in the office we used to have, can we get away with about 200 people in the physical office and then 300 people working from home at least, you know, part of the time? Because I'm sure that the cost pressures are going to cause a lot of companies to reevaluate do we need as much office space as we used to? And I'm sure that a lot of them are at least going to try to get away with less office space because you can cut down your square footage, you cut down your cost. Now, granted, they might need to incentivize some of their employees to work at home, uh, you know, for social connections and networking and things like this. They might need to make some allowances, uh, but it's surely the case that they're going to give it the try. I'm just seeing there's some several other questions sort of around the same thing, you know, the benefits of remote work and things that you just addressed. So thank you. Um, this next question is, what could be the financial impact to state governments and municipalities? Okay, this is, I, I have here, you know, in some of the previous questions, I, you know, I've been openly speculating. Here, I can, I can be pretty specific and pretty clear. State and local finances are going to be absolutely devastated. There's no other appropriate word to describe this. So state and local governments depend on personal income tax revenue, corporate profit tax revenue, sales tax revenue, and property tax revenue. Those four categories by far make up almost all of state revenues. It varies across states and across whether it's a state or a local government, but those four, that's it. So personal income tax revenue is going to crater here uh, for a while. Corporate profit revenue is going to go to almost zero, more or less. Um, and then as property taxes or as, as property valuations, if they decline, that puts downward pressure on property tax revenue. 
And given that states historically, have, you know, they all for all private purposes have balanced budget requirements, you know, that whatever they spend that they have to finance that uh, with revenue, they have very limited borrowing, is this is gonna put dramatic pressure on their fiscal situations. Their spending is up and their revenue is way, way down. So they are at least for a while going to have to go out and borrow money. One of the Fed's lending facilities uh, is making available up to $500 billion in uh, loans or, or, or the ability to purchase um, uh, state and local debt uh, up to a total of $500 billion. So that will take some of the burden off states, but not very much because the scale is going to be far higher than 500 billion. So there they're going to be trying to looking at ways to raise revenue in other ways. And, and that's going to be very difficult in this environment. Raising taxes is not going to work out too well. Cutting spending. So where do you cut spending? Well, you don't cut it with you know, public health, for example, right now. Do you cut out infrastructure spending? Do you cut allocations to education, you know, K to 12, higher education? So states are gonna be looking where they can uh, to cut spending. And that, of course, is gonna you know, lead to a, a wave of layoffs there. So state and local finances, uh, at least for the next few years, are gonna be in, in, in just dire, terrible shape. Um, well, transitioning from that question then to one that was submitted beforehand, um, we just looked, you know, we just asked you more specifically about states and municipalities. Jose Bedoya from the class of 2014 wants to know how hard are less developed countries going to be hit by uh, the results of this pandemic? Okay, another good question. Um, at least so far, the initial impact on the those developing countries' financial systems has been pretty dramatic on the downside. Uh, capital flight out of many developing countries has been far more dramatic than at any point it was during the Great Recession. Those countries' financial markets are relatively fragile compared to developed countries' financial markets. And so to the extent that you're seeing capital flight, you're seeing increasing interest rates, you're seeing a reduction in availability of funds for businesses and, and households. So that is gonna have a negative impact on the economy. Many other developing economies uh, depend on various types of exports of commodities and things like this. Commodity prices, world commodity prices have tanked. Uh, the best example there is oil because um, that gets the most news, but lots of other commodity prices have, have fallen as well. That's also going to have a dramatic negative impact on many developing economies. In terms of the impact of the virus itself, uh, the information there is a little bit sketchy, but certain countries are having serious, serious problems. Brazil, uh, Guatemala, uh, countries like this in, in South America, I know are having difficulty. India is starting to see a large number of cases. Those countries with, you know, if their population has maybe poor health to begin with, and far worse, has a relatively weak public health infrastructure, the virus itself there could do much more damage in those countries compared to other developed countries, even maybe, you know, including, you know, Italy and Spain and so forth, who have seen, you know, serious uh, damage from the virus itself. So the, the summary of this, and I wish I had better news, is the developing countries uh, could be having a much larger impact because their financial markets are more fragile, they might be more susceptible to the virus, uh, and their public health infrastructure is, is simply not as strong, is not as developed, and simply cannot handle the volume of cases that might appear. Well, that's been a, a lot of bad news, but yes. yeah. <laughs> um, unfortunately, um, Jose Noriega says, greetings from Peru. So hello in Peru. Hi, Jose. Um, his question is, what industries do you think will thrive on crisis in this crisis? Boy, that's a good question. Um, I admit this is a little bit outside of my uh, expertise. I'm thinking that at least right now, uh, any company that is involved in the provision of public health goods and services, testing, vaccination, um, things like this, providing um, you know PPE, personal protection equipment, things like this, those kinds of businesses I think are probably going to do very well, at least for a while here. Um, companies, again, this is until we get a vaccine, companies that specialize in uh, disinfecting and cleaning and things like this, because again, that's a, a critical thing right now is, you know, is, is disinfecting surfaces um, uh, and so forth. So 
um, you know, hand sanitizer and sprays and all those kinds of things. Uh, there's a huge market for that stuff right now. Uh, if you're in the toilet paper business, it's, it's really amazing at the moment though, everybody, if they have six months worth of toilet paper, you know, that sales are probably gonna fall relatively soon. Um, and so those kinds of things I think are really gonna make it. Online businesses are really taking off right now. If you look at the large ones like, you know, Amazon being the best example, uh, they're looking at hiring over 100,000 people. And so they're a large, you know, they're the largest online retailer, of course, at least in the, the Western hemisphere, uh, but there's certainly room for other smaller online retailers. Um, my wife has been online buying all kinds of things um, from smaller providers uh, that we would never under normal circumstances have considered. And so those smaller operators now, uh, to the extent that they can get themselves out there, I think now have an advantage and, a, and an opportunity uh, to market themselves in a way that they didn't have even, you know, even uh, six weeks ago. I agree, as you said in your slide deck, that there is opportunity for some creativity here. So yes. some good things to come. Um, we are coming up against one o'clock, um, but we are happy to stay. Thank you to Professor Gully for staying sure, on for sure. a few more minutes. We'll, we'll try to answer a couple more questions before we end this afternoon. Um, so please stay with us if you have the time. Seeing that the government has been exploring increasing loans for small businesses, is there a chance they might explore sending a second stimulus for the population, depending on how long this crisis remains? And what might be the potential impacts on a macro level? Yeah, so looking at the, at the first looking at the, the business loans, the small business loans. So in the CARES Act, uh, there's provision for about $350 billion of loans administered uh, through the Small Business Administration. So the applications for those, they were just announced uh, a week ago, uh, applications have already exceeded, uh, that are approved the ex for the $350 billion that's been initially approved. And so right now, Congress is doing uh, some political maneuvering to expand that. How much they'll expand it or when beats the heck out of me. Politics is even farther outside of, of my expertise here. Uh, so I'm not, I don't really want to speculate too much on that. But I think there's a very high probability that there's going to be more and it's probably going to be a lot more. Uh, in terms of the um, uh, payments directly to households, uh, those are, are starting this week in electronic form. And then uh, over the coming weeks, they'll be in, in checks uh, for those people who, um, for whom the treasury doesn't have electronic filing information on hand for. And past stimulus checks like this, on average, they've been disproportionately saved. In other words, people have paid down debt or they've put them in their, their, their bank accounts. Again, that's in the past. However, here, I think it's probably much more likely that uh, what's going to happen is people are gonna be spending these because the sheer number of people who are now out of work, the sheer number of people who've got bills, who've got rent, food, you know, utilities, payments, et cetera, they're due right now this minute or even already past due. And so that as soon as people get their individual $1,200 check or their, you know, their uh, married filing jointly, the $2,400 check, there's a high likelihood that that's gonna be spent right away. If the economy recovers, or at least starts to recover relatively quickly, that might be it. But if this goes into the, the late summer, for example, again, I think there's probably another, a good chance that we'll see additional uh, payments here. They might not be as much as the, the first go around here, but there's a decent chance, I think, of, an, of another round. Oh, Emily, I can't hear you. Uh, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Fortunately for technology, it tells you when you're still muted. Yeah. Um, do you believe that state legislation proposed to force insurance companies to retroactively amend policy language to cover business interruption losses is setting a negative precedent on contract law? This is a complicated question. And jeopardizing liquidity of major private insurers. We had several questions around insurance. So... Yeah. Um, maybe you can speak more broadly to, yeah. to the concept of how this is impacting insurance companies and, and insurance uh, policy. Okay, so let me, let me try here. So the way insurance works, it's a risk pooling mechanism. And so the idea is that over a large group of businesses, you can't predict very well which businesses necessarily might have their business interrupted for various reasons, like a storm or something like this. But over a large number of businesses, 
from past experience, you can generate actuarial tables and estimate, you know, a certain percent have a payout and then, you know, what the actual dollar payouts might be. So based on this information, you can get an idea of what the appropriate uh, um, premium is to charge a whole bunch of businesses for a given amount of insurance for given conditions. Now, with the standard insurance um, contracts like these preclude these kinds of sort of economy-wide events. And the reason these contracts preclude these things is because in these economy-wide events, everybody, all the policyholders would want to collect. And that doesn't work out. Businesses or you know, insurance companies simply do not carry enough reserves to pay out for everybody. It's a risk pooling situation where you're sharing risks across a bunch of businesses, some of whom have payouts and some of whom don't. Going back and retroactively amending these and saying, okay, well, this is now by law covered. The difficulty there is these insurance companies haven't been charging premiums that are high enough to cover the losses, the magnitude of the losses and the scale of the losses across all of the businesses. And in this case, you know, you could literally drive insurance companies, you know, into bankruptcy because they simply do not have the funds. And so they might end up paying, you know, only a fraction of what, you know, what the policy might require there um, because they can't do it hundred percent for all the businesses because of the, again, premiums have not been adjusted in the past to try to pay this out. Is this a precedent? Yes, it is. Um, if it goes through, and I know a number of states have, are, are looking at doing this, future insurance premiums are going to be substantially higher because insurance companies rationally are going to look at the likelihood of this situation being triggered again at some point in the future. And they're going to certainly prudently and rationally build up a sufficient amount of reserves to at least try to do this. So I'm not in a position here to, to say whether, you know, whether this kind of um, requirement is a good or a bad idea, but it is certainly the case that there are going to be, you know, serious repercussions, not just now, but very serious repercussions going forward. Um, this question comes from Tom Dowling, who's still on. Thank you, Tom. How have traders been navigating the equities markets? Well, the trading desks of a lot of the, the, the big houses uh, have just reported the results and their trading arms have done fantastically. Uh, when you have lots of trading volume and when you have lots of volatility in markets, then traders tend to make do a lot of trading and they make relatively you know, high profits, you know, for fees and things like this in the trading. It's another question about whether they're making money on the trades themselves. That, that's another question. Um, so as long as I think we have the continued volatility, I think that there's going to be a lot of room for traders uh, to make funds on, you know, to make profits on just the volume, but also, um, you know, to the extent that they're willing to take risks in a situation like this. I mean, going back to the old Warren Buffett, you know, buy when there's blood in the streets, is you know with equity markets and and other uh, risky assets that have been hit uh, pretty negatively, you know at some point you know things I hope of course um, you know for my own retirement obviously uh, bounce back, but in the meantime I think that there's going to be a lot of choppy trading. Uh, there's going to be more bad news at various points. There's, you know hopefully there'll be more good news eventually, but there's certainly going to be bad news on you know treatment fronts. Uh, you know, recurring uh, outbreaks, uh, all kinds of things that are going to have negative effects. And so we are not by any stretch out of the, out of the woods on, on this front yet, or even close, really. Thank you. Well, um, with the time, we'll take one final question. This question comes to us from Guillermo Fernandez, who says he's a former Fed participant, and he is one of our valued alumni volunteers. So thank you, Guillermo, for submitting this question. He wants to hear your thoughts on an idea of his. Um, if the Treasury was to launch 50 and 100 year bonds to refinance recent stimulus and plus Trump's infrastructure bill, would it also help to curve the yield curve on the longer end? Hi, Gilly. Good to hear from you. Um, boy, what a good question, because there, ha there have been recently some speculation about the Fed or excuse me, the uh, government trying to take advantage of relatively low long term interest rates. The longest uh, maturity bond that the U.S. government now sells uh, is the 30-year. Other national governments 
uh, have experimented with longer term 50 or even even 100 year bonds. And so, you know, I don't know. Um, you could do this uh, because the US government would probably be in a position to earn or to be able to charge a relatively low interest rate uh, on this given their relative safety. So the idea is you're locking in these interest rates, these relatively low interest rates for a really long term. And right now, long rates would be lower probably than they're going to be maybe for a long time. Though it's of course, you know, obviously hard to tell. So if you lock in those low interest rates for you know, decades and decades, that gives you a, a ready pool of money to finance infrastructure and you know, again, really any other spending and to finance it over a number of generations. You know, the idea being is if you build uh, infrastructure that lasts for decades, you want to pay for that over decades. You don't want to pay for it out of current tax revenue. So it's possible that you know, in a, you know, an aggressive fiscal stance, they would take advantage of that. Though I haven't heard a lot of interest on the part of the government to actually want to do that. A lot of the discussion has come from, uh, from I guess, outside of the government. So within the government, within the Treasury, they probably talked about it, I'm sure, but nothing very far has, has, has come forward yet. Well, thank you so much for talking for so long and sharing You're all welcome. the insights. We really put you to the test with lots of different sector specific questions and predicting. I hope it passed. <laughs> yes, you did. Um, thank you all for your interest today. We really enjoyed having you on the call and we hope to be able to continue to provide you content during this difficult time that's of interest and really highlighting our wonderful professors like Dave. So thank you all for joining us. We hope you join us again. Um, again, the recording of this session will go out in an email tomorrow so you can follow, catch up if you, if you missed anything at the beginning. Thanks again and have a great day, everyone. Okay, thank you, Emily. Bye now, everyone.